that which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below, to perform the miracles of one only thing, Hermes Trismegistus. Thoth Hermes, the ibis-headed, was the Egyptian god of wisdom, learning, literature, and science. He is accredited with being the first to reveal the art of writing to the present human race. According to the records available, he lived in Egypt as a contemporary of Moses. Some authorities even claim that Moses and Hermes were one and the same person. The Greek name Hermes is taken from an ancient root, Herm, which means the active, positive, radiant principle of nature, sometimes translated as vitality, and known to ancient masonry as the cosmic fire, Kiram, and later as Hiram Abif. Hermes Trismegistus, often called Mercurius Ter Maximus, dominated the philosophical and literary thought of the ancient world. His very name became a synonym of wisdom. In fact, he was revered as the personification of philosophy and erudition. He was regarded as the first Kabbalist, the first physician, the first alchemist, and the first historian. The actual life of this demigod and king of the ancient double empire of the Nile is obscured by that twilight that hides the origin of all peoples. By reason of his great wisdom and magical powers, Thoth was listed among the gods. Until today, many believe that he never existed at all outside of mythology. But if action and reaction are equal, then something more substantial than a mere legend must be the foundation for the towering superstructure of the Hermetic arts. During the early periods of human growth, when the intelligence of man was scarcely above that of the animal, all education was controlled by the priestcraft. The ancient priests were called the shepherds of men, for they guarded the flocks of primitive human beings as the shepherd does his sheep. Both science and philosophy were outgrowths of religion. In fact, all our present-day wisdom came originally into the world from between the pillars of the sanctuaries. Hermes was to ancient philosophy what Jesus is to Christianity, its light, its inspiration, and its impetus. The Egyptian initiates of the Temple of Isis claimed, therefore, that Hermes was actually the writer of all books on philosophical and religious subjects, that the supposed human authors were merely amanuenses, who wrote down upon parchment or vellum the thoughts that this god impressed upon their consciousness. In scriptural terms, they were the pens, and he, the ever-ready writer. During his lifetime, Hermes Trismegistus is supposed to have actually written 42 books. Some, however, are probably the work of the ancient Egyptian priests, for in their glory these serpent-crowned hierophants represented the wisest group of philosophers that ever lived on this planet. Clemens Alexandrinus states that these hermetic books were divided into six parts, each dealing with a separate subject, under such headings as astronomy, medicine, geography, the hymns to the gods, and other titles. During the ages that have passed, Hermes has come to be acknowledged as the godfather of science, particularly its chemical and medical branches. Even after the Christian era, numerous works dealing with religious and philosophical subjects were dedicated to him, and the general term hermetic art has been applied to practically all the abstruse sciences of the ancient, medieval, and modern worlds. The divine Pymander, more commonly known as the Shepherd of Men, and the Smaragdine Tablet found in the Valley of Hebron, are the most famous of the hermetic fragments. These two works are probably authentic and contain many keys to the universal science of life of which Hermes was a master. Nearly all hermetic thought was an elaboration of the principle of analogy contained in the great hermetic axiom. That which is above is like unto that which is below, and that which is below is like unto that which is above. At the present time, nearly all the so-called hermetic writings are said to be lost. Only a few isolated remnants remain of what once must have been a magnificent collection of philosophical, medical, and religious wisdom. During the Middle Ages, one particular branch of hermetic thought known as alchemy gradually came into prominence, and for several hundred years dominated all other branches. Alchemy was the androgynous parent of chemistry, which was separated from its sire by the speculations of Roger Bacon and Bale. While chemistry as a science dealt only with minerals, medicines, and essences, alchemy struggled with the more profound elements of macrocosmic and microcosmic relationships. 
Alchemy undoubtedly originated in Egypt, for there the secrets of transmuting base metals into gold and of prolonging the life of the physical body indefinitely were thoroughly understood by the priest craft. Ancient records tell us that the Chaldean sages knew how to rebuild their bodies, many of them living to be over a thousand years old. Many of the processes by which this was accomplished were concealed under the sacred Egyptian rituals, such as the Book of Coming Forth by Day, which E. A. Wallace Budge has called the Book of the Dead. In the Middle Ages, when religion, divorcing philosophy, was wed to blind faith, there was a renaissance of the alchemical and hermetic arts. They were revived by that type of mind which demands reason, logic and philosophy, as well as hymns and prayers. As a result, alchemy won numerous converts in Germany, France and England. The long-ignored works of the Arabian magicians enjoyed wide popularity, and from them was extracted the greater part of modern astrology. The ancient philosophies of the Jewish patriarchs were also revived, and Kabbalism became a universal topic of consideration. Paracelsus, the great Swiss physician, sometimes called the Second Hermes, undoubtedly rediscovered the ancient Egyptian formulae of the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, and around him rallied a coterie of medieval philosophers who stand out strongly against the dun-coloured background of the medieval culture. Back of this revival of interest in ancient Egyptian philosophy, we find the masterminds and guiding hands of three great philosophical movements. The Order of the Illuminati, represented by Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, Roger Bacon, Father of Chemistry, and Paracelsus, Father of Modern Medicine. It is an interesting fact that the present buildings and school of Rudolf Steiner, the German mystic, are located in the grounds of the old estate of Hohenheim, where Paracelsus lived. The Order of Freemasons, represented by the great Robert Flood, master of symbolism and alchemy, and Elias Ashmole, the unique philosopher, and the Rosicrucians, a sacred organization founded by the mysterious Father CRC after his return from Arabia. In the mythological city of Damkar, he had been educated in alchemy and astrology by Arabian adepts. After him came Sir Francis Bacon, the remodeler of British law, Count Cagliostro, the sublime adventurer, and last and greatest of all, the great Comte de Saint-Germain, probably the world's greatest political reformer and alchemist by fire. These superlative minds leavened the loaf of materiality and kept alight the flame of Hermes during the medieval centuries of religious intolerance and bigotry. Concealed beneath chemistry, the science of relating chemicals and elements, these minds discovered the ancient Egyptian arcana, long hidden by the crafty priests of Ra and Ammon. Alchemy thereupon became the chemistry of the soul, for under the material symbol of chemistry was concealed the mystery of the coming forth by day. These ancient wise men taught that the world was a great laboratory, that living essences were the chemicals, that the span of life was a period of time given to the mind in which to experiment with the great agencies of nature and that to the thoughtful came wisdom from their labors, while for the thoughtless life held only foolishness and sorrow. In this great laboratory, man learned how to combine the living chemicals of thought, action, and desire, and by learning the ways of nature, became master of nature. He became a god by actually becoming a man. In the words of the great Paracelsus, the beginning of wisdom is the beginning of supernatural power, of all the hermetic mysteries, none is more perplexing than the so-called hermetic marriage. A post-Christian interpretation of an ancient Egyptian ritual supposedly written 200 years earlier was published to the modern world in the first part of the 17th century under the name of the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Little, if anything, has been discovered concerning the origin either of this book or the Fama Fraternitatis, which appeared about the same time. The exalted order of Rosicrucian philosophers has been very reticent concerning its members and their works, and even today it is difficult to prove from a strictly material viewpoint that the order ever existed. Concealed under the quaint wording of the alchemical marriage, can he plainly trace a series of mysterious formulae concerning the transmutation of base metals into gold? The alchemist taught that man contained within himself 
all the elements of nature, both human and divine, and that, by a special culture, the base elements of his nature could be transmuted into the spiritual gold called the soul. In discussing this, Paracelsus makes plain that these philosophers did not wish to leave the impression that something could be made from nothing. Rather, they emphasized the fact that each individual thing contains all other things, and that the alchemical process of making gold was merely to culture the germ of gold, which is contained in every base substance. Modern science substantiates the alchemical point of view by stating that it expects to extract gold from mercury by taking out or isolating the electron of gold, which is one of the constituents of every mercurial atom. Taking the chemistry of human relationships as a basis, therefore, the following thesis has been created concerning the true preparation of a philosopher's stone and the elixir of life, according to the fundamentals laid down by Hermes and the ancient Egyptian priestcraft. A theory of natural creation has been generally accepted by the world's faiths with the possible exception of Christianity. To the ancients, everything in nature was alive. Therefore, they accepted the human body as symbolic of the universe. The Hebrews called this prototype Adam Cadman, or the Grand Man, in whose mold all things were made. Every system of cosmogony, except the Christian, makes the universe a living thing. Instead of a god separated from his creation, the Brahmins, Jews, Persians, and Chinese have conceived their god as being completely involved in his creation. They have accepted more literally than the Christians the idea that man dwells in God and that in God he actually lives, moves, and has his being. They call this God Macroprosopus, or the spirit of the grand man. From his body was made the macrocosm, consisting of suns, moons, planets, meteors, ethers, gases, and the sundry parts of creation. In the Scandinavian Eddas, the universe was formed from the body of Ymir, the Frost King. In India, the universe was constructed from the person of Brahma, whose members became the various bodies of the visible cosmos. The Hermetists therefore said, Man, know thyself, for thou, like God, art all wisdom and all power, and the shadow hearing witness unto the Eternal. An anonymous alchemist writing in the Middle Ages stated, God has given man three ways whereby he may learn the infinite will, nature, for in the stars that twinkle in the sky, the planets in their thundering march, and the earth with its multitude of laws, are concealed the laws of God. The holy writ, the inspired word of saints and sages unnumbered, and anatomy, the structure of our own bodies, wherein is concealed the structure of the universe, for all things are made by one mold. The electron, revolving around its nebula center, obeys the same law that moves planets around the sun. In this, we see the truth of the great hermetic axiom, as above, so below, as with the lesser, so with the greater. The hermetists spent much time studying the intricate construction of man, and, like the Brahmins of India, they divided him into three major parts. In India, this trinity of basic parts is called Adi, Buddhi, and Manas, meaning literally spirit, soul, and body. Their Trimurti corresponds to the trinity of Christian theology. Each of these three major parts of a god, a man, or a universe was personified as an individual. Adi corresponding to spirit was called the divine cause, or the father. Manas corresponding to matter was called the divine effect, being known in India as Shiva and in Christendom as the Holy Spirit. Between these two stood Buddhi, the mediator, the god-man, the mercury of the Latins, the messenger of the gods. By some, this intermediary is considered synonymous with the soul. By others, it is called mind, because mind is the uniting link between life in the sense of energy and death in the sense of inertia. To the pagans and hermetists, all things in nature such as the ethers, the air, minerals, and even the earth itself were endowed with intelligence, consciousness, and feeling. The Adi Buddhi Manas constitution of man is represented by the alchemists under the symbolism of the philosopher's stone and its three important constituents, salt, sulfur, and mercury. According to alchemy, salt is the substance of all things. 
It is the body, the form, the dense crystallized particles from which all physical things are manufactured. Sulfur is symbolic of fire, the divine agent. Fire is defined by the Hermetists as the life of all things and is the Adi of the Brahmin Trimurti. Mercury, the universal solvent, becomes synonymous with buddhi, the mind, the thing that absorbs all experience into itself. This is the link between God and nature. All the great world saviors have come, it seems, as personifications of buddhi or the universal mediator. Like the Indian Vishnu, they have sought to bring God and man closer together. Whether as Christ, Prometheus, Zoroaster, Krishna or Buddha, they have come to bear witness to the Father, and being made in the semblance of man, but imbued with the Spirit of God, they have become personifications of the universal solvent. To the Hermetists, man has always been considered androgynous, and they created the god Hermaphroditus to represent the duality of all living things. This word is coined from Hermes, fire or vitality, and Aphrodite, the goddess of water. The great hermetic and alchemical adage was, make the fire to burn in the water and the water to feed the fire. In this lies the great wisdom. The ancient Rosicrucians taught that the eternal feminine was not extracted from the nature of man, as Moses would have us think, but was rather made subservient to the opposite side of its own nature. They believed that every creature was essentially male and female, but for reasons that we will explore in another video, only one phase of that nature manifested at a time. This force personified was said to be the builder of the universal temple. It became the Hiram Abif of masonry, the builder of the eternal temple. In Egypt, this force is symbolized by a serpent, and it is worthy of note that in ancient Hebrew, the words serpent and savior are synonymous. In the stanzas of Zion, an ancient Tibetan fragment. It is stated that at one time a shower of serpents fell upon the earth. This is understood esoterically to represent the coming of the great world teachers, who have long been called serpents. The savior of the Aztecs and Incas was called Quetzalcoatl. This name means feathered serpent, from the serpent kings of Egypt to the feathered serpents of Tibet. The serpent is symbolic of the vital energies of the human body. Moses raised the brazen serpent in the wilderness, and all who gazed upon it lived. Christ, the serpent reborn, says, I, if I am lifted up, will draw all men unto me. The simile is obvious, yet few ever understand it, until they are initiated into the greater mysteries. To the ancients, the magic wand was the spinal canal. Through this canal runs a sacred liquid called fire oil, in Greek, Christos, the savior or redeemer of things. This same thought has been preserved for masonry under the heading, the marrow of the bone. The hermetic philosophers recognized this essence in man as a distillation of universal life derived from the atmosphere, the sunlight, the rays of the stars, and food. This universal vitality upon which all living things draw is probably the origin of the myths of the gods who died for mankind. It is undoubtedly the origin of the legend of the Last Supper, for man eternally maintains himself upon the body and the blood of this spirit of universal energy. If this energy, which passes through the conduit of the spine, is drained off by various parts of the body, it stands to reason that waste will ultimately result in want. We know that it is very undesirable to do heavy thinking directly after eating, for at such times the vital energies are digesting food and cannot safely be diverted to other channels. By analogy, one-pointedness is the basis of success. For when the bodily energies are divided against each other, they cannot perform their proper functions. The ancients taught that the normal individual had two distinct avenues of expression. The first, mental and spiritual the second, emotional and physical. The mental faculties were radiant, powerful, dominating and strung, but often cruel and cynical. The mind was called the positive pole of the soul, while the heart was called the negative pole. We have been taught that the spirit expresses itself through the mind, the soul and the body through the heart. The ancient alchemists called the mind the sun and the heart the moon, for to them strength, 
reason and logic were masculine, paternal, and solar powers, while love, beauty, intuition, and kindliness were feminine, maternal, lunar qualities. This will probably make clear why gold and silver had to be blended in the great alchemical enterprises, for the gold and silver of the alchemists were not dead metals, but living qualities in human life. The marriage of the sun and moon was, therefore, the marriage of the mind and heart, or the two halves of every nature. It was the union of strength with beauty, courage with inspiration, and in its greater sense, the union of science with theology, or God with nature. The urgency of this alliance is evident in the world today, where cold intellectualism and commercialism need the finer sentiments of friendliness and altruism to offset their heartlessness. On the other hand, fanaticism, blind faith, and ungoverned emotionalism require the strong hand of logic and reason to steer them away from the rocks of insanity and death. Perfect equilibrium in human nature is seldom found. In fact, it is nature's greatest rarity. A person with that perfectly balanced viewpoint, however, is the living philosopher's stone, for he has the strength matched with kindliness and justice tempered with mercy. Hermetic anatomy teaches that there are two small bodies in the brain which are identified with the living yin and yang of China. In the same way, every person has a masculine nature and a feminine nature, and never do we find these two entirely dissociated. It may be that East Indian philosophy gives us our best light on this rather perplexing subject, for both the Hindus and the alchemists agree that the spirit, like God, is androgynous, being both father and mother. It states in Genesis that God created man in his own image, male and female created he them. We would infer from this that God is both male and female, and as the spirit of man is of God, it must partake of the androgynous nature of its parent. In harmony with the Eastern sages, sex exists no more in spirit than it does in the embryo before the third month of prenatal life. Sex is a polarization of the body, a manifestation of spirit, but the germ of life itself is capable of projecting both the positive and negative rays. We now become involved in a still more perplexing problem, namely, what governs the sex which the human being is to manifest during life? Again we turn to the Eastern sages, evolution is the continuity of form appearing in cycles and gradually unfolding from a simple cell to a complex organism. If a form evolves, it is not absurd to suppose that the cause of that form is also evolving. The Oriental solves one of the Western world's greatest problems by the law of reincarnation. This doctrine, which was removed from the Christian faith at the Council of Constantinople, taught that the spirit or life is immortal, that it descends into gross matter not once but many times in order that it may ultimately gain that perfection that no living creature has ever yet gained in one appearance in the world. This doctrine also taught that the consciousness thus descending into form does not always appear in one sex, but alternates, first appearing in a masculine body and then in a feminine, this way developing both sides of nature symmetrically. If this doctrine is accepted, it will go far towards solving a number of problems concerning heredity and the so-called injustice and inequality in the world. Even without it, Hermeticism can still stand. With its aid, however, the alchemical philosophies become far more clarified. This ancient wisdom teaches that the circle of the creative forces in the human body is broken at the present time. One end of this broken ring is in the brain, where it furnishes the power or vitality that is the basis of brain function. The other end of this circle is located in the generative system, where it furnishes the means of reproducing the species. At a time remote in history, man was a complete creative unit in himself, being capable of procreating his species like certain of the lower orders of animals of today. At that time, however, he had no mind. According to mythology, the raising of the brazen serpent therefore gave him a mind, but broke the creative circuit. In the masculine sex, the positive pole of the life force is in the brain. The negative pole is used for generative purposes. In the feminine sex, the negative pole is in the brain. The positive pole is used for generative purposes. 
as a direct outgrowth of this condition, temporarily maintained in order that man may think and develop his higher nature and at the same time offer opportunity for other lives to come into manifestation, the institution of marriage was established. Marriage is, therefore, the hermetic symbol of the ultimate reunion of the two halves of each individual's nature when, after repeated appearances and associations, equilibrium between these masculine and feminine qualities is established. The wedding ring was accordingly symbolic of the golden ring of the spirit fire, which connected the spiritual and material natures of every individual. Ultimately, the present methods of reproduction will be abolished, and both halves of the spirit fire will again be turned into the brain. One of them now finds its polarity in the pituitary body, and the other in the pineal gland. These two tiny, ductless bodies, while an enigma to modern science, were recognized by the ancients as organs of great significance. The ancient wisdom teaches that the pineal gland was the original organ of vision, namely the third eye, called in the Sanskrit Dangma, or the Eye of Shiva. It is the all-seeing eye of the Freemasons and the meaning of the word Buddha. In uniting its spark with the pituitary body, this gland fuses the broken circle and thus consummates the hermetic marriage whereby, through an immaculate conception in the brain, the great light known as the Shining One is born as a luminous spark in the third ventricle, which is the Master Mason's chamber in the ancient and accepted rite. Today, students of ancient wisdom are seeking to prepare themselves for this peculiar work. The hermetic marriage is therefore an individual matter, involving the attainment of individual completeness, requiring of the aspirant a sincere effort to be balanced, sane, and consistent in everything he does. In the alchemical retorts and vials, we recognize the bodies, glands, and organs of man. And in the chemicals, the essences and forces coursing through the body. With these, the individual consciousness must labor until it is capable of combining them according to the perfect formula. If you want to delve deeper into the world of ancient wisdom and esotericism, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the channel for more insightful videos. And if you want to support my mission to unearth and decipher the forgotten teachings of the ancient mysteries and the encrypted knowledge of Western esotericism, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Until next time, continue to seek out the light. End to pan.